There was a lot of anticipation behind Fire Emblem Engage's Wave 4 DLC. New characters, a darker story which is actually canon, and of course, new chapters to play. The sixth chapter campaign was long anticipated, probably even more so after everyone's initial completion of the base game. Whether it was because characters and story fans wanted to see IS's next stab at story writing, or gameplay fans wanted to see what else its great gameplay had in store, or both. Once April 6th rolled around, many were ready for Felios. To me, after playing, the Fel Xenolog is the quintessential hot mess of all time. It's amazing map aesthetics, incredibly well done soundtrack, well written characters, their supports are also amazing by the way, an actually suspenseful and interesting story from start to finish, with story twists that actually surprised me, with an ending that I actually found satisfying and compelling, is hysterically twilighted by its unbelievably stupid choices in unit and gameplay restriction, user experience, and difficulty balance. As you may have suspected from the title and the introductory paragraph, this is an opinion piece mainly focusing on my issues with the gameplay itself. The story and characters may warrant its own, much more positive video, but one thing at a time. And yes, I will be pretty much hard criticizing Felzenolog's setup and everything it does mechanically and gameplay wise, that is your warning. This is going to be negative in nature. If you don't like it, then you can move on, but if you are curious to see my thoughts, and if you think that my opinion will resonate with yours, then I suppose you can continue watching. Before I get into the meat of it all, parts of my criticism will reference, you know who, three houses, again. I can never escape it, and it's DLC, Cinder Shadows. So let's start with some historical context on the whole Wave 4 DLC of Switch Fire Emblem culminating in a Wave 4 side story. Cindered Shadows was marketed as a unique challenge in Three Houses because it restricted a lot of core Three Houses gameplay mechanics and progression systems. Where Three Houses had its sandbox maps, unit customization, and its abundance of resources, CS first restricted your units to Byleth, your three lords, and Ash, Hilda, and Linhard, restricting their reclassing to commoner slash noble, and a tiny class tree of two intermediate classes into their respective advanced class. The wolves only had their base class and their DLC class. Weapon ranks and class EXP consequently meant nothing, and combat arts and class mastery skills were unlearnable. Cinder Shadows was a game where what you could see was what you got. It towed a fantastic line of significantly reducing what made three houses three houses, but gave it just enough customizability in the unit progression. A class tree, a few skills units could use, EXP gain, as well as access to an armory, shop, and blacksmith in the abyss itself. Because of its short run and pre-built units, Fire Emblem Three Houses wasn't about long-term resource allocation for specific units anymore. It wanted the player to focus on each chapter's goal, then move on to the next. Many people touted Cinder Shadows as the return to classic FE gameplay for this reason. Cinder Shadows was also functionally its own entity. It was saved separately from the base game, meaning that nothing from your base game carried over into it. Byleth, the Lords, and the Students were given nothing beyond what they had, and were thus on par with the OCs. Everyone started at the exact same point. And finally, there was no maddening mode, but normal and hard were balanced very well. You didn't need an extra maddening difficulty because the difficulty of hard was sufficient in combination with this mode's unique chapter goals and gimmicks. It didn't need to throw in annoying overstated enemies or excessive reinforcements. It would have thrown the balance awry. I know people have taken issue with CS's map design and map recycling, so I can really only speak for myself, but I loved my playthrough of CS. And in fact, I did a marathon of it years ago on my channel. I thought it was a great time, and I found every chapter fun. I spent the last couple of minutes explaining how Cinder Shadows functioned, because it's very obvious that Fel Xenolog was designed with a similar principle in mind. What? happened. Felzenalog, which I will now call FX for short, starts with a similar premise. It foregoes the sandboxy, high abundance resource strategy game and instead limits your units in the following ways. Once you enter Dark Lethos, characters have fixed classes, levels, and inventories that scale only as you progress through the story. In other words, you cannot reclass and can only progress automatically to a unit's natural class line. Units auto-level and rely on fixed level ups based on their growths and inventories cannot be customized beyond everyone's starting kit, and you never have access to an armory, shop, or blacksmith. Contrasted with CS, however, you have access to your entire party at the time. FX accesses your currently used save and will thus allow the use of the following. Your roster, your support and bond levels, inherited skills, and emblem weapons, but nothing else. On paper, this means Engage's units do not start at ground zero like CS's base units and OCs do. Yet ironically, FX still manages to feel more restrictive because the consequences of its restrictions are extremely frustrating, bad, and are counterintuitive to Engage's own unit progression. 
First of all, the problem with Engage simultaneously allowing the use of your entire roster at the time, but forcing them into their base class and advanced class with auto levels means that so many units are straight up worthless. If you reclassed Anna into being a sage in the main campaign to make use of her stellar magic, too bad. She is forced to being her axe user self now. Did you reclass Linden into a high crit melee user to optimize his personal and for a 100% crit chance build? I certainly did. In fact, he was one of my favorite units, but he's a sage forever now. If you know, you know. Reclassed anyone and they thrived in that class? Too bad. It's wasted here. Mileage will vary on Elir's use in his base class. I personally dislike Dragon Child, but Engage Plus is extremely, extremely good in FX. What the base game rewards for creativity is completely ignored and all the investment one could make, depending on if you reclassed and built a unit around that, well, thanks for playing. This structure also makes it ambiguous when you're actually supposed to start the DLC. If you start the DLC immediately after it's available, you're limited to the roster and emblems you have, meaning some of the best emblems and units in this mode will not be available, as well as items locked to their fixed loadout. The selective carryover has another extremely frustrating side effect. The original characters, the OCs, Nell, Nil, and the Winds are all genuinely bad units. To understand what's going wrong with them, here's how IS structured these units. In all six chapters, any OC who joins your party is force deployed, which, on paper, makes enough sense. It's no surprise that the OCs are treated as pseudo-lords in that they are force deployed, yet the wins can afford to die and not force the game over. This is the only thing about this that makes sense and doesn't frustrate me. Problem is, internally the game will unrecruit every single OC at the end of every map, and then re-recruit them with adjusted auto levels at the start of the next one. In other words, you never actually recruit them. This combined with support and bond point gain being restricted means they're stuck at a bond level 1. This makes makes them all, every single one, even Nell, who is supposed to be the good one, all functionally objectively worse units than their base game counterparts, a problem that scales worse and worse as difficulty increases. Nil is deliberately hecking awful to an absurd point. Nell is just a worse version of Tamara and Alir. Celestia starts decent in the first two maps she's in, but becomes just a worse version of Celine and Ivy combined. Gregory is a worse version of every other sage, and Madeline is just a worse version of Louis or Jade. The most value you will get out of them is putting them into bot roles because all they can do otherwise is provide chip damage at higher difficulties provided they don't miss in combat. In fact, they're so pathetic as units, part of the challenge of hard and maddening, and this applies to Nil and Nell especially, is making sure they don't die. To add insult to injury, for what may be the result of an internal flag that tells them not to let them do this, you cannot trade with them in the battle prep. This means that if you want to give Nil Micaiah for the cleric skill, you need to give someone else staves like like Physic, Mend, and Restore to another unit, and spend one turn in the actual chapter trading them onto him. This applies to every OC in this mode. But they're allowed to equip emblem rings and bracelets? Why? This serves no purpose besides forcing you to waste time and turns for setup. And that's not all. Because the OCs are treated as these quasi-green units that get recruited and unrecruited, upon a repeat playthrough of FX, they will be unable to make use of any bond level supports or inherited skills you gave them from the main campaign and will be stuck in their level 1 in everything awful, awful selves. It's actually incredible how terribly implemented this fixed mode for FX is. Nothing works in an intuitive way. The fixed inventory, which a adjusts itself each map to suit the progressively difficult chapters is also marred with frustrating design choices, which get more evident as difficulty increases. Number one, despite every character having a fixed inventory, some characters have different weapons than others. Diamant is the only character that comes with an armor slayer, which is very important to have in this mode. But if you do effects before you get Diamant, you just don't have an armor slayer for the entire campaign. If Selene died in the main story when you do effects, you just don't have access to Eleven Sword at all, ever. Which, granted, is certainly certainly not as bad as being locked to high might weapons at the cost of lower hit rates for the entire campaign. FX forces you to use lower hit weapons later in the campaign while enemies get more evasive, alongside more evasive terrain for them to go under. The latter half of FX forces axe users to use silver axes and tomahawks, which have lower hit than iron and hand axes, which you never get to use. Mages that aren't mystics, of which there are only three in Selene, Citrine, and Gregory, will struggle to hit things as surge tomes just are something you can't use in this mode, period. 
Gregory especially struggles in this regard because in spite of him ignoring terrain bonuses, has a dexterity growth of 25% and can't get meaningfully support boosted. Madeline also has a dexterity of 25% but is worse off as she is forced to use a 60 and 70 hit rate weapon if she wants to contribute at all to combat. The workaround to both is using avoid reduction on enemies via Korn's water tiles or some personal skills like Rosado's and like I mentioned you can't inherit things for the OCs for a repeat playthrough because the way FX is structured basically unrecruits your OCs and only allows the use of the FX versions which have nothing inherited or leveled up. Nil will always be annoyingly dead weight. Nell will always be mediocre and barely contributing to anything beyond chip damage and the odd kill later down the line. And the wins will always have problems hitting things. In CS you could buy weapons and staves, you could customize your inventory and it wouldn't reset every chapter. You had the option of reclassing, you could level up, and the OCs were given the exact same starting point as your base game units, but were also also extremely good in their own right because CS was designed to make them good. Yuri had fetters of Dromi which any unit could use for movement strategies and workable stats throughout. Happy was a very strong dark magic user with good mobility, Constance could fly and support, and Balthus was, uh, good enough. CS managed to restrain you to its selling point of a classic FE experience, but gave you enough freedom so you had options to tackle it and be creative with what you had. In FX, these don't even feel like units. There is no progression at all. Nothing matters beyond beating a chapter and moving on. They place all these arbitrary restrictions on you that don't feel like a classic FE experience, because classic FE doesn't work like this. It's incredibly ironic to me that in the case of Wave 4s, the team that was outsourced did a better job at understanding classic Fire Emblem than the Fire Emblem developers. This is all a little unbelievable, because all of these problems are purely user experience and structural choices that are awful, and I didn't even get to the gameplay yet. These are all things that could be so easily fixed while still maintaining its challenge and uniqueness. You have the blueprint of how the implementation works with CS right there that happened like four years ago. You can be someone who didn't like CS's map design, but still recognize where it succeeded in this regard. Quote, this doesn't feel balanced, end quote, is an often seen remark when it comes to FX's actual gameplay. And from what I've heard about the difficulties, it's fallen into the following issues. Normal is way too easy, enemies are nerfed to the ground and will often have no chance of even hitting you, and the final chapter is made much easier as Rafal will only travel directly up instead of going left to right to warp to all the sigils. Normal is the standard gameplay experience, and basically it seems like it's actually easy mode rather than normal. I played on hard hard, and it was, for the most part, a challenge. Enemies were hard to take down, as damage was almost always just not enough to kill, often leaving enemies at 1-4 to 4 HP. The gimmicks though, they were pretty good. Chapter 1 was a fine introduction to the mode. It was straightforward, Nell was actually good, and Nil's horrible stats were workable through him turning into a support bot with Micaiah. The Hex gimmick of reducing max HP into using Restore was a great one and actually made use of the staff in a way that the main campaign kinda didn't really do beyond mending poison. Chapter 2 introduced Zelestia, and the map was good fun as well. Nell was doing okay, Celestia had good spotlight, Nil was still support botting, and enemy placement and reinforcements weren't frustrating. But chapter 3 is where things started to get annoying. I kept wanting the OCs to contribute in meaningful ways, but their flaws became really apparent here. It got so frustrating to a point where I completely restarted the chapter and very quickly cheesed the map with Lin and Chloe just killing everything in sight. By chapter 4 I was getting visibly frustrated on stream by both the OC's near uselessness and really, really bad RNG. The double army gimmick worked for the most part. It's nothing new to Fire Emblem. But once I got out of the first few turns and was being pursued by Ivy and her Legion of Dragons and Flyers, this chapter felt like it was actually getting fun and remained that way throughout. Chapter 5 saw the OCs, with the exception of Nell, removed from the party. And I enjoyed the split party routes, the pseudo turn limit of trying to advance while keeping Alir and Nell alive, and the variance in the map of corridor and open space battles. And it was actually one of the funnest chapters in the story, which is a good and a bad thing, because I was enjoying not needing to use use the OCs. I was able to use my base units who were already invested and good. This is not a good trade-off as DLC, which was marketed heavily for playing as new characters. You know you messed up when someone can find a chapter fun because they weren't forced to use bad units, finally. And last, chapter 6, which again, conceptually, is a fantastic map. I would know. In fact, chapter 5 and chapter 6 have gimmicks very similar to those of my ROM hack, 
bloodlines. Just needed to throw that in there. A challenging final map where the boss will destroy terrain and everyone within it, and will warp to different sigils absorbing the bracelet equipped mini bosses to gain an extra life bar are fantastic anti-turtling gimmicks. But such a fantastic concept is ruined by its legitimately absurd amount of reinforcement spam. Once the flyer reinforcements from the bottom and left, and the corrupted wire reinforcements from the top arrive, with the exception of the left flyers, they will never stop. Reinforcements are good to keep the player on their toes, preoccupied while trying to advance to their main goal, but this gets over the top when they've already reached the final sigil on the map trying to end it. For my part, this final chapter was frustrating the hell out of me. Not only was I just constantly dealing with this spam, but my RNG was genuinely some of the worst it's ever been. I was missing high hit rates and getting hit by low hit rates, and even had to burn another time crystal because Leaf critted me for 13%. I know RNG is RNG, but it was just salt on the wound alongside the reinforcement spam. I was legitimately concerned that the hours I had spent on this map was going to be wasted as I had one crystal use left and Rafal had three life bars with Sandstorm and Luna from absorbing Tamara and Elkrist. The reinforcement spam just stopped adding a fair challenge and was falling into this is insanely annoying territory. Your map is already challenging. You don't need to do this. This was again made even more frustrating by the fact that the OCs were all borderline worthless. This in every chapter was would have gone so much smoother if the OCs could contribute more than they were minimally capable of. I can't possibly imagine this is what the developers intended for with these OCs. This is around the point where I should expect some Valiant FX map design defender to say, skill issue. I want to again emphasize that these maps taken by themselves were a fun challenge. Yes, I can rant about Chapter 6's enemy reinforcement spam, but honestly my frustrations come from what's going on with FX's structure and the weaknesses of the OCs. When I wasn't getting annoyed by trying to keep them alive and trying to involve them, these maps were a lot of fun. There were highlights in my playthrough of all six maps of fun and engaging problem solving. Restrictions like CS and FX should be good and challenging because they force you to approach these otherwise open-ended games in a more focused way. Yes, they both do that. FX wants to challenge you by limiting your options, but my issues don't come from these limitations themselves, it's the user experience, balance problems, and what feel like unintended consequences that come from these restrictions. I'm not exclusively complaining that I'm forced to use these OCs, I'm complaining because I'm forced to use bad, dysfunctional units, and I hope that I'm properly explaining the difference. To those unaware, a method to clear this map, even on Maddening, in one turn was discovered about a week ago. It involves equipping Alir with Roy for holdout plus plus plus, higher stats, but more importantly, sword power 5 from him and reprisal plus from Veronica. The former giving attack plus 10 and minus 10 avoid when using a sword, the latter adding 50% of HP lost to attack. Combined with Alir's Liberation, adding 15 attack when fighting Rafal, and debuffing through Draconic Hex and Strength Rallying slash Spur Attack, Alir is able to take damage from her fall and deal enough back to surpass the minus 50 damage reduction from his sigil. Rinse and repeat, and eventually he will die in one turn. Which is cheesy, sure, but this method can only be done with end game investment. To inherit both to Alir, they need a whopping 11,000 SP to spend, as Sword Power 5 is 5,000 SP and Reprisal Plus is 6,000. I'm sure as hell not going to grind SP and Bond Fragments just for this one thing, but I'm not hardcore enough I suppose. If you don't kill Rafal in one turn, from hard to maddening, best of luck to you. So many attempts to do this on maddening without proper post-game investment have led people to bang their heads on the brick wall trying to figure out how to do this, to lowering the difficulty to hard because of how frustrating it is. Which sounds intriguing in a way, as if to say that FX's maddening endgame is for only the most hardcore of players with the most optimized builds. That being said, congrats to the individuals who came up with that Alir build though. I know it wasn't just one person, but a handful of people trying to come up with a solution to Maddening's C6. All in all, it's a pretty impressive strategy. And pretty cool, all things considered. Balancing maps and difficulty is a delicate process of near endless testing of enemy placement and stat allocation to create a challenging yet satisfying experience. The fact of the matter is, the transitioning from hard to normal is a difficulty whiplash so much so that normal becomes a skip game setting, which is a balancing problem, and hard and maddening is made unnecessarily frustrating by its forced use of its bad units, bad hit rates, and reinforcement spam, which the former two at least could have been resolved 
easily. I may come off as really, really butthurt about this because this video is pretty much all negative, so I'm trying not to sound super emotional or anything. At the end of the day, while this is only a 6 chapter ordeal, also meant to be a big incentive for getting the expansion pass worth 30 real dollars. FX nails so many other aspects. The story is this brutal, nihilistic reimagining of Elios. Nell's story from start to finish, especially to her final choice, is shocking yet understood. It's hard to get into the why without getting into spoiler territory, but yeah, it's just the dysfunctional, unintuitive fixed setups and the harsh difficulty scaling that drastically lower the quality of this experience. These are good chapter gimmicks and maps held back by everything I talked about. To end on a more productive note, how could FX be fixed? It honestly all comes down to the integration of the OCs. The carryover of emblems and inherited skills to the base roster is nice, but because of the unrecruit to re-recruit nature, the OCs cannot shine. One simple solution is to just give them fixed bond levels with emblems that adjust with every map like everything else. Or do that, but give them a higher level with bracelets as they are familiar with those in the rings narratively. As for skill inheritance, let them inherit skills with a set base SP, which increases every chapter. Because if you didn't notice, they do have base SP that just gets unused. A second solution, to keep up with the theme of restricting options for a different experience, preset everyone with fixed emblem and bond levels, skills, and with their canon class. That way, you could challenge the player by restricting them like before. But like CS, now everyone is on the same level, and the maps can be more tightly balanced because there's no impossible to predict variability in player investment. And no player investments will be cheated out because you don't get the chance to use your main character builds in the first place. It may sound like a turnoff to restrict the roster even further, but you'd be surprised at how, if fine-tuned enough with the non-infinite resource Resources, but useful preset skills and varied equipment, challenging, rewarding, and creative FE maps can be. In other words, instead of souping up the OCs, put everyone on the same start point like CS had for theirs. A hub area could work here, but in order for things to fit the narrative, an economy can't really exist in the form of an armory shop or blacksmith unlike Abyss. But I don't see an issue with somewhere like Lethos Castle being a base where inheritance and bonds can increase. Bond levels and SP being fixed for the OCs would also let Nil not cheat you out of resources given he leaves at chapter 5 and 6 as well. This would give the OCs a fighting chance with the unique trait of being extremely flexible with preset bond levels with the emblems you already have, while playing within the game's rules. And for the sake of replayability, upon a second playthrough with the OCs, unless they're dead in the main story, let the player use the OCs in the party. A lack of armory slash shop can be simply resolved by adding more to the convoy at the start of a map. Being able to fix Gregory's hit with Surge, or salvaging what little Madeline offers in her current state with a compact axe to contribute more would only positively benefit them. Here's something else actually hilarious about the OCs. Do you recall my support boost slash support type video from when people cared about engage, and how Mavir was the default support type only giving hit plus 10 no matter what the support rank was? Well, guess what? Every OC is also the default support type. Yep, to those who care, the only support boosts you're getting is hit, even in the main campaign. This is extremely stupid. I would give these units support types that aren't just a complete waste of time. The twins and the winds are all tight. They could be given C supports with each other, while the twins can be given even further viability with an A support together. This in particular would give Nil further use beyond being a Makaya slash Byleth slash Corn bot. And what I mean by the support ranks is exactly that. Obviously you can't unlock supports to view them as contextually they do not make any sense, but visible ranks for the purpose of gameplay thematically make sense. Even Cindered Shadows did this. All the wolves had C supports with each other. The fixed growths and auto levels are fine, and as for the forced cannon class rule, I'm honestly not sure how this could change beyond just giving them another popular class promotion option. That might be an L you just have to hold, unless you go with the option 2 of preset everything. Then again, given how non-specific these chapter goals actually are, maybe you could just get away with carrying over classes anyway. Balance normal so it actually fits the definition of normal instead of easy, and remove the condition of needing to complete the DLC every new campaign. Unlike CS, there is no alternate timeline. These characters are working worked directly into the continuity of Engage, so just do what 3H did and make them playable when FX would have otherwise been unlocked via a flag getting triggered after beating it once. FX is completely inconsequential for unit progression anyway. And finally, just 
Let them trade in the battle preparation, good lord. These are my off the dome propositions to fix the user experience, viability of the OCs, and to not have the player resources go to waste in the form of builds. Would this affect the balance of hard and maddening terribly? Besides making the mode easier by virtue of elevating the quality of the units, I genuinely don't think so. Thanks to the fixed inventory, you can't break the flow of these chapters via warp, rewarp, rescue, and entrap, except for when you actually do have rescue in chapter 6. But you're giving the player what they should have already. Common feedback for the mode is that it's way too hard anyway. So, kill two birds with one stone, you know? Well, that was a very, very thorough review of Fire Emblem Engage's Fel Xenolog. This video is really long, but I hope you enjoyed it. If you're still watching, please consider leaving a like and comment down below with your take on FX, what you liked and what you didn't like, or just something about this video. Finally, if you'd like to support the channel directly, you can become a member. Channel memberships currently give you the following perks. A member badge next to your name, custom emotes, members only status updates, behind the scenes videos, and exclusive Q&As. This is a great way to support my channel directly. I recently posted a video to members and patrons about my feelings on Engage's various support conversations, so if you want to see that, please consider joining. I'll also be posting a behind the scenes video on this and afterthoughts, that kind of thing, later on next week. Thanks for watching. Deuces. Thank you.